Welcome to Historic Holidays on Hilton Head Island. I'm Jem McEwen, Director of Cultural Affairs for the Town of Hilton Head Island. And even though the holidays may look a little different this season, and we all might be sticking a little closer to home, we still want to share the magic of our island at the holidays with you. We're going to visit sites and see how Union Army soldiers celebrated together. We will learn how enslaved people, newly freed in 1862, celebrated a Christmas with a new special meeting at Mitchellville. We'll hear stories from the fishing and farming era on our island and learn about low country traditions that have carried forward today. So please join us for historic holidays on Hilton Head. We're here at our first stop during historic holidays on Hilton Head at the Coastal Discovery Museum with Executive Director Rex Garnowitz. Rex, can you tell us a little bit about how the holidays were celebrated here on Honeyhorn back in the day? I'd love to. Thank you so much for coming by. Happy holidays. I'm the director of the Coastal Discovery Museum, but before that I was an archaeologist. And so I'm going to take a deep dive into the history of the holidays in Hilton Head Island. One of the things that fascinates me is if you go back um, into the, the earliest history we have, when we had the French and the Spanish here, we have some of our earliest holidays. So the first Thanksgiving you ever had um, in North America was probably 1564, right here um, in Port Royal Sound on Paris Island. And so there's some great early stories. And one of the things that I was kind of fascinated about with the Christmas holiday is that if you look at colonial Christmas um, in the late um, 17th, early 18th century in South Carolina. Um, that was one of the four um, signature days of the year that marked the changing of the seasons. And so December 25th was the start of the third quarter and the new year actually started in March 25th. And one of the problems they had in early South Carolina on Christmas was people were shooting off guns and fireworks and making a lot of noise, which is very different from our holiday, holiday celebrations today. So Charleston actually passed a law in 1750 outlawing the shooting of guns and fireworks on Christmas Eve, which is something you don't think about. Um, and then the other thing that I was sort of fascinated about in the, in the history of Christmas is that South Carolina, uh, you know, really was very open um, to people of a lot of different religious beliefs, as long as they weren't uh, Roman Catholics. And, and so we had the largest Jewish community in North America, um, but, but Catholics were banned from South Carolina until 1790. And so you don't have your typical like St. Nicholas type celebrations in early South Carolina. And of course, there are no Christmas trees until you get into the 1850s. So these very early holidays were about family. They were about food. Um, they were about hunting. Um, and uh, there was gift giving, but it occurred after Christmas, the day after Christmas. People were given Christmas boxes, which had small presents in them and may um, have included uh, the things that you know every kid wants to get like a new pair of shoes <laughs> um, so uh, that like sort of was happening one of the things that it sort of ties to at historic honeyhorn is the early holidays here were very much of a later uh, tradition which is what we're familiar with where we have Christmas trees uh, and eat like turkey and cranberry sauce and so there's this great um, book that uh, Avery Hack Doubleday wrote about growing up at Historic Honeyhorn and it sort of tells you these stories and there are a couple of them that really resonate with me. One is going out on Hilton Head Island to find a Christmas tree and cutting down just the right Christmas tree and sort of arguing like, is this Christmas tree too bare on this side? Is this branch too crooked? Is the top snapped off? And then chopping it down and bringing it back. But, but what's most vibrant about that, I think, is the smell um, of a freshly cut pine. And I think that reminds a lot of us of the holidays 
And it's fascinating that that's what we maybe most closely associate with it, not shooting off guns, but how those traditions change so much over time. And um, one of the other things I thought that I read in this book that was a really good tip um, was um, using magnolia leaves as a garnish all around the house and, and over the fireplaces, which I hadn't actually thought of until I read it here. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's a beautiful sort of low country plant that brings green into your house um, in the winter. Um, there's also a great story about um, stuffing the kids' stockings um, and they all get this little tiny demi tasse spoon from somewhere in the bottom of their stocking every year. I think those types of family traditions are ones that we can connect to ourselves. Um, one of the ones that uh, I connect to in terms of food is making your own cranberry orange relish with an old grinder and putting the cranberries and oranges in there and grinding it out because that's something that I did with my grandfather when I was a little kid up in New Hampshire. And I think so some of these holiday traditions that we have here are universal amongst our families and, and, and the previous generation that we learned from. So there's some great stories here and it's really a wonderful place um, during the holidays to just come and walk around. It's great to read Avery's book. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't recognize is the history of this property that um, you know at one point in time it actually was a plantation and people were enslaved here and i think it's important to think about that over the holidays um, what life was like for everyone that lived on hilton head island not just the people that wrote the history here um, and i think that's um, something that we should consider and think about during this time one of the other things that I think is interesting about this property is that it was a hunting retreat. And so hunting is a big part of historic holidays in terms of providing food for the table. And I think that's something that's worth reflecting about as, as we eat our holiday meals. Um, and that on this property, it wasn't just the Loomis and Thorne family that lived here or the Hack family, but a lot of people um, whose descendants come visit today lived on this property. There were a number of houses and there really was a sense of community here. And so as you come and walk around our property on the holidays, think about everything that happened here when you're underneath these trees that are 350 years old. Think about the, the holidays that have passed, um, come and gone on this property and how times have changed. Um, from the days when people were shooting off guns for Christmas to the days where people were making cranberry relish with their kids. Rex, thank you so much for your hospitality. The Coastal Discovery Museum is truly one of the great gems on our island. Thank you for visiting, and I hope that other people will come visit over the holidays. The museum is open, and we have great things in our museum store. We have holiday jams and jellies. We have all the local authors and some really beautiful Gullah Sweetgrass baskets. And when you leave here, you really must go see my friend Ahmad Ward at Historic Mitchellville. He knows all about holiday traditions on the island. Awesome, will do. And you can find out the hours of the gift shop here at the museum at coastaldiscovery.org. We're here at Historic Mitchellville Freedom Park with Executive Director Ahmad Ward. Happy Historic Holidays, Ahmad. Season's greetings, Jim. Can you tell us a little bit about how the holidays would have been celebrated here when the um, community was living at Mitchellville? Absolutely, I'd be glad to. Christmas holiday at Mitchellville would have been a very important part of the year for the community. Uh, of course, you'd have, like any other community would have, they would have the family gatherings, all the delicious food that you can think of, but specifically, you'd have a big gathering, First African Baptist Church within the first church there. Abraham Murchison would be presiding over a big Christmas service, and people would gather in and around that church to talk about what had been a great year for them, what they were thankful for, and you had to follow up with this very important Marsh Tacky race on Mitchellville Beach, would have been right there at the edge of the community. Uh, it's been a tradition for years. In fact, going deep into the 20th century, those, Mitch those Marsh Tacky races would have taken place on the island. That happened every Christmas. And it was a way to kind of put a final uh, pin on the year. 
they found gift giving and being around each other just as important as you would right now. Uh, and the most important thing for Mitchellville is understanding that freedom is something that they enjoyed all year round. It was a very important part of what uh, made them feel like they were actually able to celebrate a Christmas in the first place or any kind of holiday for that matter. And so historic holidays on Hilton Head for all people would be about love, would be about family, would be about understanding that, hey, we have something that's ours here and belonging is important to everybody. Thank you, Ahmad, for sharing how the first freedmen would have celebrated the holidays here at Mitchellville. It certainly gives us a deep appreciation for the historic roots here on Hilton Head Island. Be sure to check out Around the World Season's Greetings, the holiday light drive through December 5th through 7th here at historic Mitchellville Freedom Park. Ahmad, I passed a fort on the way in. Do you think they celebrated the holidays there? I am absolutely sure that they celebrated the holidays there. But you're going to talk to my friend Lauren to hear more about that. You can often find me, especially in the cooler months, biking or walking on the more than 60 miles of leisure pathway that we have here on Hilton Head Island. Our leisure path connects many of our cultural sites along with all of our communities together. Right down the road you'll find Fort Howe, up the street from Mitchellville where we just were. Fort Howe was built in the Civil War to protect Mitchellville and all of Hilton Head Island. Happy historic holidays from Fort Howe. We're here with Lauren from the Hilton Head Island Land Trust to teach us a little bit about the fort. Lauren, I heard that Fort Howe was built by the U.S. Colored Troops to protect Mitchellville, the all-black town up the road that we just came from. Yes, Jen, that's true, and thanks for being here today. Fort Howe is a very special place, and those who celebrated the holidays here during the Civil War would agree. Let's learn more about how people celebrated the holidays at Fort Howell in 1864. My name is Lauren Williams, and I'm the president of the Hilton Head Island Land Trust. You're joining us here today at historic Fort Howell. Fort Howell is owned and maintained by the Land Trust, which is an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization. Our members and volunteers work hard to maintain Fort Howell and to cultivate an experience for visitors to realize what it was like to travel back into time and see the fort through the eyes of the colored troops and the people who lived in Hilton Head before and after the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, the holidays days were not celebrated by the U.S. colored troops. Uh, most of your uh, encampments, the, the general orders were that we were not to celebrate it. Uh, so to say that we celebrated in the old encampments, no. I bet that was difficult to sit here and know that it was Christmas Day or some other meaningful holiday to you and you couldn't celebrate it outwardly. Well, and, and sometimes you had slaves that were, or enslaved people who were given away to uh, new masters as Christmas gifts or what have you. So to say that it was something that was celebrated or welcomed, um, you kind of have to look at it in several different ways. If you look around, this is vast. We're sitting, standing on the highest point. This is the north point of the fort. And to have soldiers, hundreds of soldiers, that are digging it to build walls as high as the one that we're on, it was a massive taking. Uh, to have pans, pots, shovels, men just digging, you have to look at what we were doing it for. Uh, Mitchellville, which is right down the road, was being protected by this fort, by men who were enslaved, by men who became soldiers, by men who fought for freedom. So to build this fort, size of this fort, to look at it, to come back and see it, this was a great undertaking and we're very proud to have built this fort. Been working here, you miss your family and you may leave just to go see your family, but then that comes with consequences. Uh, some of the guys would come back and find out the next day they may be demoted uh, to, from a sergeant to a corporal, from a corporal to a private. Mm -hmm. What was it like knowing every day that you were fighting to protect the people of Mitchellville and their freedom? Empowering. You take your freedom into your own hands. You connect to the land that you've worked for generations and you create and build your own. You protect your own. So it was hard labor, but it was worth it. It was a labor of love because it was for yourself and taking ownership of yourself and your freedom. Sounds like that was the ultimate motivation, the motivation of freedom. 
Well, I always use the term from slave to soldier to freedom. What better motivation can you have? Right. So one of the main goals of the land trust is to preserve this fort and to protect it and to build it up so that it can be a showcase for the island, for people to really experience and connect to the history and what was going on here before the Emancipation Proclamation. What is one of the things you guys coming back here today want to make sure is highlighted and preserved for future generations? Time repeats itself. Being back here at this moment and seeing what the land uh, has turned into, the fact that some of the walls have now deteriorated, knowing the history, knowing the struggle, knowing the battles that we've been, knowing how we've fought for this land. To have the land trust to take it over, to preserve us, to remember us, you know, as a people. To have the feeling of we did something that was great. We did something that we can stand up to. We can do something where our ancestors, our children, their children can say, we were part of America's history. This is not just African-American history. This is not African history. This is America's history. Well, we as a land trust take that very seriously and we're honored to be here with you guys today to learn more about what it was like to celebrate the holidays here at Fort Howell or really not celebrate them. It sounds like it was very unique and different than what our traditional experience is today and I appreciate you t teaching us and letting us know what it was like, giving us your perspective. What's powerful is I feel we were not celebrating Christmas but celebrating our ability to fight for our freedom. I think that's one of the things that's most important. Thank you Lauren and the U.S. Colored Troops Historic Interpreters. Now let's head over to the oldest building on Hilton Head Island at the Zion Cemetery. Hi, Dee. Hi, Jan. How are you? Good. Happy Historic Holidays. Thank you. So we're here at Zion Cemetery, which is the colonial period cemetery on Hilton Head Island and home to four grave markings of Revolutionary War soldiers. It's also site to the oldest building on Hilton Head Island, the Baynard Mausoleum. Dee, can you tell us a little bit about the Zion Cemetery? Certainly. Um, first of all, my name is Dee Phillips. I'm co-chair of the Heritage Library History Department. And the Heritage Library is a nonprofit. It is a history and genealogy research library. Now, the Zion Cemetery is one of our two historic properties that we have, uh, historic registered properties on the island. First of all, I'd like you to see, standing behind me, as you can see, is the Zion Cemetery. It's made up of the Kirk plot, the mausoleum that you mentioned, and of course, the grounds that behind the Kirk plot, we would have had a chapel of ease. And over, as you enter, you will find that we would have had a muster house, but we no longer have that. The reason that I mention these properties is because this is the only Revolutionary War cemetery on the island. And because of that, our patriots that you mentioned that are here would have been doing drills at the muster house. They would have been patrolling the island, protecting their homes. And during the Revolutionary War, this was very important because we had Tories in Charleston and Tories in Defusky. And on this island, all of the families were patriots except for one. Now, I'd also like to tell you just a little bit about those families. Those families were very wealthy, many of them, but many of them were not. Those that were wealthy could afford to have homes, uh, plantations. There was about 25 plantations during the Revolutionary War on the island, but many of those had plantations in Odesto, or they had plantations in Charleston, or down in Savannah. Those that had homes here were just like farmhouses, so they're not those grand plantations that you would think about. Now, they're busy. The planters are worried about food, protecting their families, taking care of everything, but they're also concerned about the holidays. And of course, food, family, homemade games is what's going to top all of that. Hi, my name is William Eddings Baynard. I built this mausoleum here in 1846. And I want to tell you a little something about the holidays 
at what happens around Christmas. The crops have been, fall crops are in now and everybody's getting ready to celebrate. In fact, our, our people made these wrath. What they would do is take a wreath, would take cotton balls and, and turn it into a wreath and give it to our family for our use. We in turn would give clothing and gifts and uh, everyone would be ready for uh, some time off and some well-deserved rest. But some, once in a while, they would travel this, from plantation to plantation to visit friends and family. And sometimes the celebration could go on for as long as a week. Happy holidays, everyone. My name is Mary Elizabeth Baldwin Kirk, and it has been my destiny in the afterlife to be the caretaker of the Kirk family plot. So welcome to my family. My husband, James Brown Kirk, and I reside here in the largest monument. And nine, excuse me, six of my 15 children are buried here. Normally I give you all the story of the Kirk family, but today we're going to be talking about what we do over Christmas. First, let's talk about the decorations. Now, just for your information, we didn't have Christmas trees. We didn't have St. Nicholas in the 1820s and 30s and 40s. Those came later. But if you've been in the Low Country, you know that there's so much that you can decorate with. Of course, we have hollies. We have hollies, we have magnolia, we have ginger lilies. And the Spanish moss makes an absolutely wonderful bow uh, or a wonderful a wreath which you wrap around some grape and then you include your berries and of course we always had rosemary left over and we would decorate with the rosemary. Food and libations throughout. For months before Christmas time we were preparing the beef and the cattle and the hogs and the lambs for the season and we would spend weeks creating these festivities. There was plenty of libations too, a lot of wine and brandy and rum for those who could afford it and for those who could not, they normally made homemade muscadine wine. We were of a wealthy family and a lot of the gifts that we purchased for our children came from Savannah and they came from Charleston. But we, instead of always having homemade gifts, my husband James and I wanted to make gifts for our children so they would appreciate the uh, importance of, Chris, of, of the season. Of course, we made dolls for the girls out of corn husks. And we often sewed these checkerboards made out of cloth so they could just stick them in your pocket and take those checkerboards with you, the checkers with you, and pull them out at any time and there is a cup and ball game, very easy to make, that the men would carve the wood and then flip a ball in it. This was something that the boys loved and would spend hours doing. Another thing you see a lot is your bamboo. And if you let this dry out, this bamboo could make wonderful fishing poles, or most of the time it was more like sticks, and the guys, the boys would be fighting with it. Or if you wanted to cut it short enough, it could be a watermelon spitter in the summertime. Make it about that tall, and it would really shoot out those watermelon seeds. But my favorite time of Christmas was the Yule log. That was a tradition that we bought over from Europe. And here is just a simple log that would be put into the hearth for the entire 12 days of Christmas, from Christmas Eve on up till January 6th on the 12th night. Now depending on what the family wanted would determine what kind of wood you would put in your fire. Oak, as there is so much oak around here, would provide wisdom and strength and understanding. If you wanted prosperity, pine was the particular wood to use. And if you wanted children and fertility, birch trees were used. And I will tell you, in the beginning of our marriage, we had plenty of birch logs that we burned in the holidays. 
Afterwards, we decided that we would go to Wisdom and Understanding, and we went to Oak, and then we went to Pine because we needed the prosperity of all those children that we were producing. I would like to, uh, the, there was a lot of time that we had to take, that we wanted to take. Historians in the future notice that there's not a lot of, of writing or scribing at this time of year, and that's because we were so busy creating the festivities. But it was important to take the time off, and my husband, the overseers, all the workers, and even the slaves were given time off around Christmas. Perhaps they would go to other plantations to see their families, or perhaps those families would come to us. And we always had a pineapple at our house, whether it was in Kalawasi or whether it was in Bluffton or here on Hilton Head. And the pineapple represented that we were home and that we were entertaining and that we would love for family and friends to come and see us. This was a Christmas wish and it was, ca it was called the Full Corn Crib. And this is what we wish for you. Suppose the crops don't grow. Suppose there is a failure and the corn falls short and the cotton sheds and the army worm appears and there is an early frost. These things will happen. We will lose our crops now and then. It can't be that we shall always have things as we wish them. But we can be good natured and loving and cheerful and thankful for what we do get and for the things for which we are prosperous. There's no reason a drought should dry out our hearts also. There's no reason that short crops should make us short to our friends. And there's no reason that a cold winter should make us cold to our neighbors. And there is certainly no reason that an early frost should freeze up our charity. Our gratitude shall not fail because the sunshine fails us. We must only make the hearth fire brighter. We must make sunshine for ourselves and gather our friends about the warming and make merry within. Merry Christmas to you all. Hello, my name is Lydia Page Devant, and um, I am married to one of the plant, one of the uh, indigo planters. James was one of our patriots as well. Now, um, we, our plantation is named Point Comfort. And we do grow indigo as well as um, Sea Island cotton. Now we were blessed with uh, six beautiful children. And you know, I wanna talk today to you about the kinds of things that we do during the holidays at the Devant family. This time of year, we have a tradition and maybe you do yourself. And that is making bayberry candles. Now, bayberry candles are actually made from a wax myrtle, which grows on the island all the way actually from Maine down to Florida. And I send my children out and they pick the berries. Sometimes they bring back the branches and we will, uh, but you can see how small those berries are. And do you know, it takes 15 pounds of these berries to make one pound of candle wax. Now the Bayberry candle scent is a lovely scent and I'm sure you probably smelled it at Christmas time. Um, again, first picking and go out, I challenge you to go out in your backyard and look and I, pretty much guarantee you, you've got a wax myrtle tree. Sometimes they refer to it as the candle tree. Now, bayberry candles were the very first in America that were the scented candles that are used. And um, they also are wonderful down here in the South because they don't melt in the heat. Now, how you make them is you pick those berries you put them in your pot and add about two inches of water, boil them, and then let them cool. And a wax film will come to the top 
of which we skim off little by little and then we set about making those candles which I'm sure you've seen where you dip them in so it is a very very time consuming process but everyone treasures their bayberry candles oftentimes given as gifts and in fact do you know in New England there's one city because they were so precious these candles that they had a fine if you started picking the bayberry well, wax myrtle seeds before September 14th. You were fined if they caught you. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a candle holder like that, which by the way, this is a Bayberry candle. This is called a cording candle. And if you can see, you can rise or lower the candle and here's how the story goes in this hoarding if there's a gentleman that the father really likes he will set the candle very high and say to the court quarter come in and you and my daughter can be together till the candle burns down to the nub now, if he doesn't, he's not impressed with that young man. The candle is pushed down, so there's very little to burn. And the same story is true. Now, my husband, James, when my, my namesake, my daughter, Lydia, was being courted by Thomas Webb, who both are laid to rest in our beautiful Zion Cemetery, he certainly, we both liked William, so the candle was high. Now there's a little poem that goes with a Christmas, a Christmas uh, about giving the Bayberry candle to your friends. And it goes something like this. Burn your Bayberry candle on Christmas Eve down to the nub, and it will bring you good health in your home and money for the next year. Now, I should also just mention a little more maybe about my family. Um, again, my husband and um, his father, actually they moved from Edisto Island over to Point Comfort. And that's on the south end of the island. But they became very successful indigo planters. But both of the brothers, when we decided to break from the British, were part of the militia here. And my dear brother-in-law, Charles, was the only soldier that was killed here on the island by those, the Fusky and the British regulars. My name is Charles Devant. I was a member of the South Carolina militia during the American War for Independence. Uh, during the holidays, we would, uh, we would drill still and we'd go out on patrols uh, looking for wagon tracks, temporary camps, weapons left behind, anything that would lead us to believe that there were Tories on the island. The holidays didn't change anything in my life, really. Uh, the most that the holidays ever did for me was I would give a small gift to my son and my wife. Uh, I saved up a little bit of money each year to, to um, Put away on the plantation grounds every every Christmas, but other than that, Christmas really never had any impact significantly on my on my day-to-day -day life in the colonies. But I during during we had our muster house around uh, around this spot, and at the muster house we would practice drill, uh, line formations, uh, fire, firing practice, and, and uh, basically everything that we would need if we were ever in open field combat, which was very rare, if we were not in a very military, militaristically active place in South Carolina. Uh, now, of course, if we were further in-state, we would need to use these skills much more often, other than in light skirmishes, because militia were very frequently used on the field of battle. Uh, they actually took up the center of the line at Cowpens. But here, we, um, we had some minor conflicts 
with the Tories over on Defusky Island, uh, where many historians believe actually we had the last battle of the, of the war in 1783. Uh, but overall, the, the holidays uh, were, were not a big deal in colonial times. Um, not any, any, anywhere close to being as big of a deal as they are now. But Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. I'm Captain John Stoney of Tipperary, Ireland. I came to Hilton Head with my wife Elizabeth and my son James in 1776. I bought the plantation called Otto Burn and quickly got involved in the community activities. You see, I was the head of the Moster House. I was just reminiscing about Christmases during the war. My child was just young and I was such a busy man, such a busy father that I don't know if I spent enough time with him. I did whittle him a few toys to be with, to play with, but uh, I was so busy as part of the United States Navy attacking the ships from Britain off the harbor of Savannah and stealing the goods and selling them up in Beaufort. Yes, I remember in those days, and now I was thinking about my new home up at Braddock's Point that I had built. So often at Christmas time, we had to travel all the way near Okati to go to church at the St. Luke's Parish. But I petitioned the council to allow us to build a chapel here at Titton Head. And in 1788, it was completed and it made it so much easier to attend church. And so my wife and I would go there for our Christmas services. But the important thing is that we supplied most of the game, the food that we ate at Christmas time. I and the other planters would go hunting, looking for deer, looking for rabbit, looking for squirrel, and we would have the servants prepare the food for us. This Christmas, my wife wants me to shoot down some mistletoe. She loves to play the game where the young men hold the mistletoe over the fair lady's head, and she could not refuse a kiss upon her cheek. It's quite a fun game, and after the kiss, he plucks one of the white berries and throws it away. When all the berries are gone, the merriment is over. Wow, thank you so much, Dee. I'd love to encourage everyone to come out to the Zion Cemetery. Tours will resume in March on a weekly basis, and you can also book private group tours. So Dee, you mentioned another fort on the island that has a special story to share. Yes, that's our Fort Mitchell, and be sure to visit Rich. He's the other co-chair of the history department, and find all out find about the Civil War uh, structure that is there. It's an earthworks fort and it's really interesting. Wow. Now let's head up to Skull Creek to visit our friends at Fort Mitchell and learn about how they celebrated the holidays. Hi Jen, welcome to Fort Mitchell. Thanks Rich, happy historic holidays. Happy historic holidays to you. We're here with Rich Thomas of the Heritage Library, and he's going to tell us how the soldiers would share holiday traditions during the Civil War, even when they were far away from home. Hello, I'm uh, James Seabrook. My family has owned this plantation in Seabrook for many years. Many things have happened lately. The Battle of Port Royal, the South lost, and the Union soldiers are, are coming ashore now. And they've selected Seabrook as a place for a perfect place for a fort. And we have a, a dock here, and uh, right now everything is in a state of a state of flux. As my family has left and moved to our home in Alabama. My name is Charlie Klein, and my title and position are both corporal, and I help with drill and keeping the camp in an orderly orderly fashion and I keep the men disciplined and well-dressed. I uh, came to Fort Mitchell around 1862, back when it was called um, Battery. The holidays at Fort Mitchell were um, not unlike the rest of the year. We, um, with the exception of us decorating with Christmas trees that we would make ornaments out of brass buttons, nails, shells, uh, anything that was shiny enough to be to be used um, as a, as, an, as a little ornament, uh, we would make special um, special food. It wasn't a feast of anything or anything. It was um, uh, it was really meat pudding uh, is the best way to describe it. We we would make meat stew and combine it with our hardtack. 
Hey, I'm uh, Steve Fonda, the sutler here at Battery Gilmore, uh, better known as Fort Mitchell to you. Uh, I've been the sutler here since 1862. A sutler is a guy who is licensed by the Department of uh, the U.S. Army, actually, to sell goods to the soldiers here at the camp. I get most of my supplies brought up from north by ocean-going barges that unload the goods right here on Skull Creek. I have flour, salt, things to read like Harper's Weekly, newspapers. You can even buy Bibles from my store. I usually don't take credit though. I'd rather have you pay as soon as you get paid by the government once a month. One of the problems I have though is getting enough things for the holidays, like eggs and rum so the guys can make eggnog. I've been lucky though to get a wagon load of sweet potatoes from the native islanders. Got plenty of those to sell. Now some of the guys think I'm a robber, but let me tell you this, if they go over to the town that grew up around the fort, the main fort, Port Royal, they will pay a lot more. They call those merchants over there robbers. Hello, my name is Frances Barker Gage. I came here to Hilton Head Island in 1862 as a teacher with the Freedmen Association. I wasn't always a teacher. I was a feminist. In fact, I was in the National Convention, ran that in Cleveland, Ohio. But times change. And as the Freedmen Association needed other individuals, I chose to come here. I'd been here about a year but it seems as if I'm going to have to leave now. There's an appointment over at Paris Island. But one of the things I wanted to do is to try to find Clara Barton before I was going on to Paris Island or to the Buford area. You see, Clara has said some kind words about me to many of her friends. It seems that she liked all of the things that we did for women's rights and working with the blacks. In fact, I hope to run into her and invite her over to Buford so that we might have a long conversation, but I haven't been able to see her yet. Perhaps I should get on my way. If I tarry too long, I'll miss some of my students, some of the freedmen who are planning for their holidays. Hello, it's Ormsby McKnight Mitchell, Major General, U.S. Army, Commanding General of the Union Department of the South, headquartered here on Hilton Head Island during the years of the Civil War. I'm the third commanding general of the Department of the South and I arrived on Hilton Head Island in September of 1862. At the time, I made my residence near the main encampment and the main fort near the former Confederate Fort Walker, which was rebuilt and renamed Fort Wells by the Union for its occupation time. There were approximately 35,000 troops that were stationed at Fort Wells during the war. And Fort Mitchell, where we are today, was a satellite camp from the main fort located here on the banks of Skull Creek. Fort Mitchell was really designed as a coastal battery and a coastal artillery battery to prevent a Confederate counterattack by water coming from the port of Savannah across the inland waterway. Fort Mitchell at any given time had approximately seven to 900 troops here who were stationed and slept in a camp uh, in an encampment behind the main wall of the fort, which is off to our right. The main wall of the fort was an earthworks wall, which was built by excavating dirt from a trench that was thrown on top of pyramid-shaped piles of logs, which were laid horizontal along the ground, and those were laid out in a crescent shape along the entire length of the fort. Fort Mitchell, which was originally named Battery Gilmore, for the chief engineer of the Union Army who supervised its construction in late 1861 and early 1862. And it held approximately five to six cannons at any given time. And those cannons were on three gun platforms that all had different orientations to the approaching waterway. No attacks ever happened here at Fort Mitchell during the years of the war. And in 1864, because of the lack of any Confederate threat in this area, 
Most of the troops that were on Hilton Head Island, as well as all of the armaments and munitions that were here at Fort Mitchell, were redeployed up to Richmond and Petersburg in Virginia for the siege works that were there. But our intent today was really not to just acquaint you with the site, but also to give you a feel for what the holidays might have been like for the soldiers in camp and the people around them during that period of time during the Civil War. And it was a different time. Before the war, Thanksgiving was not a national holiday. And Christmas was a loosely celebrated event, which was still frowned upon by groups of religious purists who considered it just a showy display of materialism during the High Holy Days. So in 1863, President Lincoln declared that a Thanksgiving meal be served to all of the forces in the military on a day in late November in 1863. And that became the first Thanksgiving in the armed forces. The following year, early the following year, Lincoln then declared that every year on the fourth Thank, uh, Thursday in November that a Thanksgiving feast be provided to the members of the military. And what happened was that that occasion began to be very eagerly anticipated by the people at home who were very sad about the separation of themselves and their loved ones who were soldiers and sailors in the field during the war. And then it was in 1870 that President Ulysses Grant signed the National Holidays Act which essentially made Christmas and Thanksgiving a formal federal holiday. So in a way, the war transformed what had been a relatively free observance of periods during the year, the harvest period during the year and the birth of the Christ child, made those into national holidays of prominence. And it was that closeness that families associated and the warmth of the holidays with time together that really made those into mandatory observances as opposed to optional ones as they had been before the war. So I'd like to read a poem that's attributed to a man named Will Carleton. Will was a member of the 6th Wisconsin Regiment that fought at the Battle of Gettysburg where he was wounded. And after the war on Christmas in 1865, he wrote this poem which was published in Harper's Weekly. Today at home beside the hearth, warm with the ruddy embers glow, we keep our Christmas so unlike the Christmas of a year ago, when in camp at earliest dawn, the grimly throated cannon woke our slumbers, and within the east, the golden light of morning broke. Ah, then the smoke of battle hung its sulfurous cloud our land above, and bitter feud and hatred filled brave hearts that should have warmed with love. But now at home beside the hearth, we keep the day with song and cheer, while from each spite the Christmas bells ring out with voices sweet and clear. Bring holly, rich with berries red, and bring the sacred mistletoe. Fill each glass high and let our hearts with kindliest feelings overflow. So sweet it seems at home once more to sit with those we hold most dear. And alter absence once again to keep the merry Christmas here. This day the Prince of Peace was born when hope first dawned upon the earth. Today with fervent hymns of praise we celebrate his wondrous birth. Who set the bonds of death aside and triumph o'er the voiceless grave, the risen Christ, God's holy Son, who died to turn a ruined world to save. And in that spirit of togetherness and warmth, we wish you very happy holidays and a Merry Christmas from people at the Heritage Library and here at Fort Mitchell. Wow. I know that soldiers today miss their families too. As times change, things still stay the same. We want to say thank you to all of our troops who are serving this holiday season at home or abroad. And thank you, Rich, for sharing. Jen, you're welcome. And we can't wait to welcome all of you back here to Fort Mitchell beginning in March for our tours once a week at this site. Now we're going to head over to the Spanish Wells community and talk with our friend, Mary Young, who will teach us about the tradition of the Christmas walk in Spanish Wells. Oh, yeah. Christmas was so back then, and so much. We're very different from now. We didn't have not have what we have today. But we, we always were happy. Everybody was happy whatever we had. We didn't have the, the food as we have today, but back there, 
we, we would have, uh, everybody, you know, back there, every, how we live was farm, farming in the, over the river, fishing, conquering oysters, <laughs> and all, everything out of the field. So in the summer, they would secure everything for the winter because during the winter month, you couldn't find those things. So, but we have enough food left from the summer to take us through the winter. And then, on Christmas, we would have turkey. We didn't know what a ham was back there, but we would have turkey and pork. Kill their own pig, and then they kill their own turkey. And they stew it, you know, they cut it up and stew it because we didn't bake like we do today. Stew turkey and stew pork. And our dessert on the, on, on the stove because they didn't bake like we do today. Dessert on the stove such as potato poon and dumpling and all that kind of stuff. But we were happy, we had a good time. Uh, I live here, my daughter lives here, and every, each of them cook a lot of food, and the neighbors and friends go to their house, come to my house and other house, just as we used to. Mm -hmm. Only we just have more to offer, a lot to offer these days. We have seen and learned a lot about our local history and how our holiday traditions have grown from our historical past. We have one more stop to learn about holiday traditions from days gone by. So let's head on over to the Gullah Museum and see what they have in store for us. We're here with Louise Miller Cohen, the founder and executive director of the Gullah Museum of Hilton Head Island. She is also a Gullah elder and a famed storyteller. Louise, Merry Christmas and Happy Historic Holidays. Well, thank you. Merry Christmas to you and welcome to the Gullah Museum site, the Gullah Museum of Hilton Head Island. And we are just so excited to, um, to be here with the museum and to be able to tell the story. And most of all, I'm excited because I can share with the children how it used to be back in the day. So um, welcome, welcome. And, um, and of course, um, when we reopen, well, of course, the children are welcome as well. So thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. Hi there, everybody. I am Louise Miller Cohen, and I'm doing a reading called Twas the Night Before Christmas. Now that's the traditional name, but today I'm going to do Twas the Day Before Christmas, and I'm doing it Gullah style. So this is Louise Cohen version of it was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Now that's the way it traditionally sound, but saying it in Gullah is gonna be a little bit different. It's the day before Christmas all over Hills and Ed. Everybody been busy, because we all had something to do. We whitewashed the house, we raked the yard, killed the hog and shaped the meat. The moonshine liquor, they on the shelf, Grandpa drink up all by himself. We decorate the tree with what we had. We ain't had no light, so red crepe paper wasn't bad. It a Christmas Eve and the children done going into bed. The Santa Claus coming tonight. They get up early in the morning for see what need the tree. It been a pair of socks, new shirt and a pair of pants. But when that boy see that red dump truck, he put a grin on his face and he start for dance. Some get clothes, some get a doll, some get a t-shirt, but that was all. There been plenty of food on the table to eat, red rice and colored greens, ham, chitlin, and pig feet, baked raccoon and tater salad, blackberry dumpling and tater poon. The men was coming from all around, Stony, Squire Pope, Jonesville, Jarvis, and Spanish Well, Gardner, Marshland, and Chaplin, Fish Hall, Big Hill, and Big Old. Oh, the mosh tacky tacky race was about to start. One, two, three, here they go. Uncle Walter lost the race and it broke his heart. Uncle Thomas and Jerry is the winner again. Wow, the race is over and they will never forget who lost and who won the bet. Please put more food on the table. 
the moonshine liquor and the Mayo Mulberry wine. Look out now, we're gonna have some fun. Everybody get off your feet and take a seat. We're gonna sing, clap and shout. Tell Big Mama to set the song, because we're gonna walk in Jerusalem just like John. Wow, we really celebrate. We got up early and we stayed up late. We used to have so much fun and such a good time. Now that all happened in the past, but I'll never, never forget. I have so much to remember about the 25th day of December. So Christmas done come and almost gone. My belly full and I'm feeling fine. I only wish I had a little bit more of the mulberry wine. So all I can say is Merry Christmas, honey children, and to all the honey, a good night. The Gullah people are what makes this such a rich culture and such an important part of Hilton Head Island. Thank you, Louise, for sharing the language and that beautiful story with us. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for being here, and thank you, thank you to everybody, and I'll be right here for seeing everyone who'll come. Thank you for joining us for Historic Holidays on Hilton Head. We want to thank the Heritage Library and all of their partners for sharing their traditions with us. And we hope that you'll make Historic Holidays part of your future celebrations when you can come back and join us on the island in 2021. We look forward to seeing you then.